Eight days later, Jesus came and stood in their midst. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. About a hundred years ago, around the turn of the century, there was a fairly well-known artist named William Holman Hunt, and he painted a what is now a pretty famous painting of our Lord coming to a door and knocking on the door holding a lamp approaching at night. Now, I'm sure many of you would recognize this painting if you saw it. It's pretty, pretty well known. You see it oftentimes in rectories and churches and uh, pious homes and things like that. Well, whenever William Hunt was revealing this painting, he had sort of a big show of it, and he invited several other artists and um, cr critics to come and, and view it. And he revealed it. He, he, he showed everybody his newly finished painting of our Lord, and there was dead silence throughout the room. Nobody wanted to say anything. And they kind of looked at the painting, they stared at it intently, and they watched it, until finally someone had the courage to speak up to uh, William and say, there's a problem with your painting. You kind of forgot something that's important to the message of, of the, the painting you're trying to display. And he said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, simply put, you forgot to put the doorknob on the door, right? You forgot to paint a doorknob for the Lord to open the door to make it in. And he kind of laughed and said, I think it's you who has missed the point. I deliberately left out that doorknob to emphasize the theology of mercy. The fact that this door can only be opened from the inside. This door can only be opened by the one inside. It cannot be opened from the outside. This door is the door of our heart, and Christ respects it absolutely. It's very much an important thing to remember that in order for us to hear the knocking of our Lord when he comes looking for us, if we are to hear that knocking and to let him in because he will not force himself in, we have to have a certain sense a certain degree of detachment in our life to hear that. I think this is oftentimes a major aspect of the attribute of God's divine mercy that is overlooked. This is an, a major aspect of how God interacts with our soul and wants to impart onto our soul his divine mercy that we oftentimes fail to remember is the fact that our Lord respects our free will absolutely. And that until we have made a resolution to let go of everything in this life, to be detached from everything in this life, our Lord can't get through the door. Now, we say, of course, well, that's certainly true of mortal sin, right? You know, I've tried to get rid of any mortal sin in my life that kills the life of grace in my soul, kills God's life in my soul. I don't want that present there. But what about venial sin? What about the, those deliberate offenses that we make against God? One, one priest in our community likes to say, venial sin doesn't mean trivial, right? Venial sin doesn't mean trivial. What venial sin means is that we don't necessarily outright break the law of God, but we do wound it. We, uh, we, we wound that grace that within our soul, and it makes it more difficult for us to practice virtue. I think it's an important examine we can all partake in. How often, how many times a day do I commit deliberate venial sin? You know, you, you do a little examination of conscience and we can say, okay, I know this is technically not a good thing to do. I know this is technically not a good TV show to watch. I know this is technically not a good thing to say. But we say it and we do it and we watch it anyway. These types of 
dispositions, these types of uh, sins that can oftentimes creep into our life, it's important for us to be attentive to them in order to take full advantage of the graces that God wants to impart to us in his divine mercy. I'm sure many of you that are here today recognize and are here because of the Divine Mercy Sunday promises, right? The fact that our Lord promised Saint Faustina, and I quote from her diary, number 699, the soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. On that day, all the divine floodgates through which graces flow are opened. That's a pretty incredible gift. But we have to make sure we look at this through the eyes of the church and we understand exactly what happens on Divine Mercy Sunday and how we can take the most advantage of those graces. First of all, they, we have to make the distinction between the promises of the diary and the plenary indulgence that was granted to the church by Pope St. John Paul II. Right? The promises of the diary say that one who is in the state of grace and receives Holy Communion on Divine Mercy Sunday, so the, prep, the, the presumption here is that you're in the state of grace, and if you're not in the state of grace, you go to confession as soon as possible before you receive Holy Communion, that all sin and all punishment due to sin is wiped away. What an incredible gift, right? That's the promise of the diary, that we are, in a sense, returned back to that baptismal purity when we were first baptized. Now, the church never came out and officially endorsed this, never came out and said, this promise that St. Faustina received in her diary, this absolutely happens, right? But Pope St. John Paul II seemed to be very personally devoted to this, and even went so far as to institute this Sunday as Divine Mercy Sunday to encourage people to partake of this, and to further encourage people, he instituted a plenary indulgence to go along with it. Now, plenary indulgences are oftentimes very misunderstood in the church, right? We don't always understand what that means and how the church does that. Well, we understand it, of course, in the sense that Christ, through his passion, death, and resurrection, won for the church many, many graces and merits and treasures. And the church can call upon those merits and treasures to those who are disposed to receive them, and she can give them out for people who are willing to do the necessary works to obtain them. So for a plenary indulgence, you have to do a couple of things, right? You have to go to confession, within 20 days prior to receiving the plenary indulgence, right? You have to receive Holy Communion on the day that you are seeking the plenary indulgence, and you have to do the work that is necessary for the indulgence, and you have to pray for the intentions of the Holy Father, right? So when, if we want to receive the plenary indulgence associated specifically with this day today, we have to fulfill those four things. Now, the work that... Pope St. John Paul II asked us to do to receive that plenary indulgence today is to publicly participate in devotion to the divine mercy. Now that can be in the form of praying the divine mercy chaplet in a public area. That can mean uh, praying the uh, novena that is uh, prayed throughout the, this, these past nine days to the divine mercy. There are several ways to participate within that but we have to do that work. Now, that's what we do externally, right? That, those are the things that we perform externally to receive that plenary indulgence. We make those prayers to the Holy Father. You go to confession. We have that true repentance of heart. We receive Holy Communion, and we do the work necessary. But there's also interior dispositions that we have to have. You have to have a firm resolution to stay away from sin, mortal and venial sin. There is no divine mercy 
without true repentance, right? So the church asks us that we make an effort specifically on the day that we're receiving a plenary indulgence, we make the effort to stay away from all sin. And if we don't, and we fall into venial sin, and we allow ourselves to fall into our faults and things that we don't make that effort, then it's no longer a plenary indulgence, it's only what we call a partial indulgence. Which, granted, that's not something to sneeze at either, right? Partial indulgences are wonderful ways in which we can help to remit some of that punishment due to our sins. The whole purpose behind indulgences is that not that they forgive sins, we have the sacraments for that, right? The sacrament of confession forgives our sins. Receiving Holy Communion can forgive venial sins. A good act of contrition can forgive venial sins. A plenary or a partial indulgence, what those things do is help to remove that punishment that we owe to God for our sinfulness. It's that uh, those penances and those sacrifices that God explicitly asked us to take up in the scriptures. He said, unless you pick up your cross and follow me daily, you will not have life. You will not, you cannot call yourself my disciple, right? Our Lord was very specific that we as Christians are called to suffer in the same way that he did, and not just for suffering's sake, right? But to work towards our salvation. The Lord even went so far as to say that heaven is taken by violence, and it is the violent that take it by force. It is those who are willing to enter into those acts of penance, those acts of mortification, that live in the divine mercy. This is so, so much emphasized in St. Faustina's diary. If anybody has the opportunity to read it, I would encourage you to do so. It's quite beautiful, the way our Lord interacts with St. Faustina. Uh, and how he explains to her just how much he wants to impart his divine loving mercy to all who will accept it to all who will participate within that. Our Lord, sacred heart, desires that union with our hearts. But again, he waits at the door with no doorknob on his side. He waits for us to give him that okay, to give him that entrance. And the only way that that really takes place and that really happens in our lives is through true repentance. There was a story of a, uh, a woman who was a very, very pious and God-fearing woman, took care of her family and her children and raised them in the faith. But she had this one, one sin. She had this one struggle that she refused to confess. She was too embarrassed to confess it. And so she would go to her confessor, and she would confess all of her other sins, and when it came to confess this one sin, she just couldn't do it. And she, she would just be unable to move forward with it. And she would cry many hours and many tears before the icon and image of the Blessed Mother, asking the Blessed Mother for help and for mercy, because she just couldn't confess this one sin. And finally, the woman died, having never confessed that sin that she was so ashamed of. And after three days of mourning and weeping from her family, she was in her coffin at the church, at the, the, the steps to the sanctuary of the church. And while the family was about to begin prayer services, she sits up in her coffin. And then that freaks everybody out, right? And she says, quickly, call the priest, I must confess. And so they go and they, they, they call the priest. He comes in and she makes her confession. And she says, I want to tell to you what happened after I died. She said, after I died, my soul was taken down to the depths of hell and the demons had, were rejoicing and dancing over my soul because they thought that they had won a soul. That they had won because I refused to confess that sin. 
And she said, as they were rejoicing and dancing over me, I saw a bright light and a lady walking towards me. It was the Blessed Mother who chastised the demons, saying that they had no right to condemn this soul before it had been judged by her son. And so Our Lady picked up that soul and brought her to the throne of Almighty God. Now when she came before the throne and judgment seat of Christ, she saw the look on our Lord's face and he was most displeased. And our Lord looked at his mother and said, why have you brought me this soul? And she said, because this poor woman has cried many tears before my icon and has asked for my help. And he says, yes, mother, but there's nothing I can do. This soul has not confessed. The soul has refused to ask for that forgiveness from the sacrament of penance. And she says, yes, son, but surely there's something you can do. There's some mercy that you can have for this soul because she has been so devoted to me all these years. And our Lord looked at his mother and said, so that you will not be saddened, mother. I will tell this woman's guardian angel to take her soul back to her body and give her one final opportunity to repent. And then her soul can be saved. And so this woman's guardian angel took her soul and brought it back to her body, and she arose and made her confession. And her final words to her family members before she laid back down in sleep in the Lord, she said, do not cry for me, do not mourn for me, but pray for me. Pray for my soul, pray for my salvation, and pray that the mercy of God find you at the hour of your death. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.